Hey there, it's JP, and welcome to yet another episode of Word on the Street with JP. Today is March the 16th, 2023. It's a beautiful morning, oh, about 9.30, and it's raining, you know. And um, yeah, today we're going to talk about love and the family. But first, I'd like to invite you to smash those likes and shares, those buttons, so we can all do our part in spreading the gospel around the globe. When we do that, it gives us a, a better organic reach and more people hear the word. So let's let's get that done. And just know that these episodes aren't monetized and that they are made available with the intent of spreading the gospel. And that is it. And in saying that, okay, so because of the ever- changing conditions in these days and times. I can't stress to you enough how important it is that we bind together. We've got to be together on this thing. Enjoy what God has given us, especially when it comes to our families and our relationships. And it seems that war has been waged on the nuclear family and in our homes altogether. And we need to be able to recognize it when we see it. So we can wage a worthy defense in return. So I remember back in the day when things were good, when I was just a little tyke, I have so many fond memories of how our family used to be. I was just a little guy and I used to sit on my dad's lap and he used to tell me silly little stories that now that I reflect back on them made absolutely no sense. And during these times, Mom used to walk by pretending that she wasn't listening and just quietly laugh and shake her head. She's just like, these these folks are a trip. You know, and my dad, he was such a kid at heart. And because of that, he really had a way with us. And we were always amused at his antics. He was a practical joker. He was always laughing. And we always felt safe when we were around him. It was like he was my big buddy. And he did. He called me Little P. And he could really relate to me on my level. And I, I aspired to be just like that when and if I ever had children. I sure miss him. And I miss those days. But what I realize now is that now that I'm an adult, is that as gentle as he was to us kids, he used to be just as hard to use that same intensity going hard in the world back then. And that's what really drew me to realizing how opposite he was. He was on both ends of the spectrum. He was a great dad and hard in the streets. And this is when I was about six or seven. He was a cool dude by the world standards and an even cooler dad. So we weren't really a family that went to church because we had a relationship with the Lord, but it was because it was just that. That's what folks did back then. It was customary to go to church. And now that I realize that God calls us from, even before we enter into our mother's womb, I realize that dad was just anointed to be my dad, I guess, you know. Okay, so when things were good between him and mom, I used to ask him what he liked about her. And he used to say, your mama's a stallion. I used to like, what? Your mama's a stallion? Stallion meaning a tall, beautiful sister. As back then, mom was five foot seven. That was tall for a woman. Beautiful and dark as a newborn brown coat. And I had no idea what that really meant. But every time he would say that, I would just giggle at it as he began to tickle me till I almost wet my pants. He was a hot mess. I used to ask him why him and mom fought so much at night. Little did I know that the noises I would hear weren't the noises of two people fighting, you know? <laughs> and he would just laugh and say, a man and a woman that are married should always fight. Fight meaning, fight being a code word for making whoopee. And he would just lift that one eyebrow up I guess that's where I got that from. And he would just laugh. Now, back then, things just made sense. Life seemed so much easier. 
than the things of today, because they were. And there was order in the family. You know, mom and dad respected each other. There were disagreements, but rarely got out of hand. And when they did, they got out of hand, though. Don't get me wrong. And there were summer vacations, and both parents attended our school functions and plays, and they even sometimes helped us study for our parts. They attended and even coached, in my, in my case, t-ball and little league softball. And we always would go away to a beach or to the mountains or to a cabin or something for the weekend. But oh, how things have seemed to change for the family of today. And find out what the Word of God says about these sorts of things right here on Word on the Street with JP. Welcome, welcome back. If this is your first time, welcome. If it's not your first time, welcome back. <laughs> so welcome back to yet another episode of Word on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP, and today we're going to explore our many differences and in some cases what we use as excuses not to really, really get involved in caring for one another the way God would have us to do. And we're going to search the scriptures so we can know what our conduct should be, especially in, in these last days. But first, let's take this lesson to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this time together and we come to your throne to acknowledge your might, to acknowledge your sovereignty and your love for us all. We invite the very presence of your Holy Spirit to help us get what it is that you would have us to receive on today, not only collectively, but Lord God individually as well. Give us that rhema word that you have designed specifically for us, that you may have your will in our lives. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for the rededication to yourself of the United States and that your very spirit would fall fresh on us and on those we have laid upon your altar. And it's in the mighty name of your son, Jesus, our savior, that we pray these things. Amen. Okay. So yeah, welcome back to another episode of Word on the Street. And this is going to be a short episode. It's not going to be anything dragged out. I'm just going to be spoken and concise right to the point. And I'm going to ask a few questions. I'm going to start with the first question or a couple of questions. Have you ever seen a tall, beautiful woman with a short, overweight, bald man walking through the mall holding hands? And then you notice that they both have wedding bands on and wonder, how in the world did he pull her, you know? <laughs> Or have you ever seen an olive oil looking older lady, not that olive oil wasn't attractive because she was a cutie pie, with a bronze Adonis for a husband? Again, don't we always wonder how in the world they got together or wonder how they met and what they see in one another to this day? Oh, if we could hear the stories, I bet we would be shocked you know, to find out what the, what the answers are. We'd hear stories about how that little tubby bald guy used to be the captain of the football team and the quarterback of the team that went to state. We'll hear stories like that. Or we hear about how the bronze Adonis was failing a class when he was in college and how his olive oil looking little cute wife was his tutor. And they hooked up and 
something supernatural happened. And the, but the truth is that they experienced something special with one another that overshadowed what everyone else perceived. And that's what has happened in the life of the believer when it comes to how God feels about us and how he wants us to feel about each other. He loves us so much that he gave us an opportunity to be a part of his permanent family. And we as family here on earth should emulate that same love. Even when we can't love ourselves, he loves us. It's the most amazing thing. Even when we cheat on him with things of this world, he loves us. Even when we turn away from him or stop trusting him with the things that concern us, he loves us anyway and has fashioned the love he has for us in the form of the love that we should emulate in a marriage and gave us the perfect example of sacrificial love when he gave his son, Jesus, to die for us on the cross. And we, even though his love was perfect for us, continue to reject him in many cases by not loving him or loving each other. How is that when he clearly tells us that if we've done it unto the least of them, we've done it unto him, good or bad? Yet we ignore not only that he is insistent that we love each other, we stubbornly refuse, continue to refuse, years of refusal, and let those earthly relationships simmer in a stew of unforgiveness, which turns into regret. This is very evident, even in the body of Christ, as we share the same statistical failures regarding divorce and domestic violence even as the world. We sometimes fail to teach our little ones because of the lack of how we should love them. We fail to teach them how things ought to be in the home and how love should be obvious in the life of all believers because it's maybe not cool or makes us seem square. We actually give a hoot what our kids think of us when that is secondary to us preparing them for a life of love in Christ. And well, there it is. The sacrifice. Sacrificing ourselves on the altar of obedience rather than hoping everything turns out okay for them because we can't find the time for them and consequently have taught them nothing concerning the things of God. And we'll see how that ends up if we continue down that path. We can't leave that part of their education up to our pastors, to their teachers, to our Sunday school ministers. They need to glean from their worship experiences on Sundays when we take them to church or whenever it is that we go and then be able to field their questions at home to have them answered through the lens of love and the word of God. What happened to those days where we actually as a family sat down and discussed our issues through the lens of the word of God? And how can we lead them in their Christian walk, their Christian experience, if we're not having one ourselves? I'm just saying. So it seems that our willingness to sacrifice ourselves on the altar of denying our pride and our reputation escapes us as we are more than happy not to have to put up with somebody who we have even vowed to love for the rest of our lives, respect and cherish, take care of, our spouse. Now, I'm not pointing fingers because I've allowed myself to fall victim to failed marriage too, but God has beginning to show me that we must love sacrificially and has shown me there are so many things and attitudes that I should have and could have changed, but refused to. You see, the example that we should take is that of Jesus and how he loved the unlovable. We are called to love the unlovable. That being a man-made word, because there's actually nobody that God is unable to love. And that should be our stance too. We should be 
fighting to labor to love, but are we willing? I dare to answer that question with a resounding, nope. Are we able? Again, the answer is probably no. At least it's no if we are trying to do it in our own power. It's definitely no. Because folks are a hot mess down here. I agree. Me being one of them. And the word of God says that love on this level can only be accomplished if we love with the love of Christ. So let's put our houses in order because Jesus is coming back soon, y'all. Let's lay down the pride and the selfishness that prohibits us from loving the way God has called us to love him and one another and begin to love with the love of Christ, the love that he showed when he sacrificed himself for our sins on a cross that he didn't even deserve. So how can we say we love God if we can't love one another? How can we be assured that we have been forgiven if we're not even willing to forgive each other? How can we continue to condemn if we don't want to be condemned? So let's lay down those hidden things that stop us from doing our very best, those hidden sins that keep us from the love that we expect from on high and the love that God has for us that should be spread to all we come into contact with. We need to let those things go that aren't pleasing to God, plain and simple. You know, those things that cause us to want to protect our wrong behaviors, those private things, those things that weigh us down like, I don't know, drunkenness, addiction, pornography, the cares of this life, you know, just for an example, those things that we have claimed that we've already turned over to God in the first place. It's all right to argue and to disagree. I call those intense moments of fellowship, but that shouldn't escalate to a point where it serves as an excuse to stop loving one another and harbor unforgiveness and the condemning approach when it comes to a relationship with each other. Because it only translates to how we feel about God. We have to realize that. I can't believe the amount of Christian couples that divorce that say we just don't love each other anymore. Really? <laughs> when God says that we should need to love all men, we're in direct violation of God's law. It's a commandment that we should love. So in case we haven't been paying attention, each other is all we have lately, <laughs> you know? And some ask me if I think things will ever go back to being the same. And I dare to say, I don't think so. A welcome to the new normal. And can't we see the condition of the world? Aren't we paying attention? Don't we realize that now is the time to bind together, whether we share different points of view or not? As long as the staple between the both of us is the word of God and our faith in him. We need to be the family of faith like we claim to be. Letting the word of God be the final authority in all of our discussions, all of our disagreements, all of our arguments, so they don't escalate into something that the enemy can use. Let's face it, if we don't get this love walk together between each other, we can't truly love God. We run the risk of coming up short in his sight. And that's not going to be a good position to be in should Jesus go ahead and crack that sky. I'm just saying. The word of God tells us how we can practice so we can be ready for our heavenly home. And it tells us in Luke, the 21st chapter, the 34th through the 36th verse. And it says, and take heed to yourselves. That means <coughs> pay attention be conscious, be deliberate in your actions and your attitude. Lest any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. I looked at surfeiting and found it 
to mean a cause to desire no more of something as a result of having consumed it in excess or doing it in excess. Now that's doing too much, isn't it, y'all? Okay, and so verse 35 says, for as a snare shall it come on all of them that dwell on the face of the earth, 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So it's saying we need to conduct ourselves in a lovely way to avoid being overcome with addictions and drunkenness and the cares of this life that mean absolutely nothing in the spiritual or in other words, giving more time to building earthly treasure than heavenly treasure. It says we can't be consumed with those sorts of things or that day will come upon us quickly and without notice. And it'll come up on us like a trap, just like it's going to come up on those who reject Christ like a trap. It says, so we should always be watching for these signs, watching for the signs of the end of the age, watching for the signs of his return, watching for what's happening according to the word of God that would bring th these things to pass and pray about those things that we would be counted acceptable and worthy to escape all these horrible things that the word of God says are coming upon the earth. So y'all get ready and get this love thing together for God and for each other. So in summary, I look back on how my dad felt about my mom to the point that he would ask to marry her. That's even how I felt about my wife before things began to fall apart because of our lack of sacrificial love, our lack of doing the sacrificial things that we vowed to do at the altar that love requires. It seems that the promises that came with the question, will you marry me, weren't kept in our cases, but they're being kept by the Lord. He's filled us up with power. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He has given us promises that we can lean on when we go to his throne in prayer. That's love. He's holding up his end of the covenant, the marital covenant. So thank God that he is still willing to take us as his bride. We should keep this in mind, keep it in perspective when we deal with one another as God deals with us on that level of love. So thank you so much for listening, watching Word on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you want to, or you simply want to rededicate your life, your efforts to our Lord, I invite you to say the simple prayer after me. That's you. You know that that's you. That thing that you feel in your chest, that thing that you feel in your throat, the moistness of your eyes, that swelling up in your spirit, that's the Lord tugging on you right now. He wants you, he loves you, he wants to show you how much he loves you and he wants to show you how much he desires for you to be with him for all eternity. So let's say this prayer. You know that that's you. Give in to the spirit of the one and only true and living God and repeat this prayer after me. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner in need of your forgiveness, in need of your salvation. I believe that you are the one and only true and living God. The one who loved us so much that you sent your only begotten son to die on a cross for my sin debt to be the perfect sacrifice. And in doing so, paid that debt in full and rose 
with all power on the third day, I ask that you please forgive me of my sins and that Jesus would come into my heart and live in me so that I will be yours and you would be my God. And it's in his name, Jesus, that I pray, amen. So I believe that if you said that simple prayer with all your heart, you meant that thing in your meaner, <laughs> you meant it, then I want to be the first to congratulate you and welcome you to the family of faith. So welcome to the family. My first recommendation for you would be to attach yourself, go find them folks who've been preaching to you all these years, not giving up on you, You're constantly in their prayers. They're telling you, I'm praying for your brother. I'm praying for your sister. Find them and let them rejoice with you. Connect yourself with a Bible-based ministry, one that the Spirit leads you to and one that can teach you about the things of God so that you can begin your work in ministry in expanding the kingdom of God. Yeah, so thank you so much for this time. If you dig what you heard, make sure again to like these videos and and um, subscribe to my to my channel, Rain Radio ATL. That's R E I G N Radio Alpha Tango Lima A T L. Rain Radio ATL on YouTube. Scroll the query, look for Word on the Street with JP. There's about a hundred and I don't know. 75, 80, maybe by now, videos, teachings, and definitely share so that we can all do our part in spreading this gospel around the, the world. The Bible says that before the end of it all, the gospel would be spread abroad throughout the whole world. And this is rather than this station being monetized, this is the end goal of Rain Radio ATL and Word on the Street with JP. Except no donations, except, I mean, I've, I've accept donations, but we don't generally do all that. And we don't um, monetize the station. There is no monetary. I ain't getting paid for this, is what I'm saying. I do this every day and have been for years in order to spread this gospel. That is it. I'm just being obedient to what my calling um, requires. He told me, spread the gospel. He didn't say, make a, a lifestyle out of it. He didn't say, um, make a job out of it. This is not a job. This is a situation where I get to serve. It's an honor is what it is. And so let's do our part in spreading the gospel. Share these videos. Let's begin to pray for those who we know are lost. Even the worst of them, you have no idea. The worst of sinners makes the best of Christians. Let's lay on our face about these people and bring them into the body of Christ so that they can enjoy salvation, number one, and enjoy an eternity void of hell. I'm just saying. And so thank you so much for listening, watching Word on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP. And yeah, let's take care of ourselves. Take care of each other. Because if things get any worse, baby poppy, each other's all we're going to have. We need to trust the Lord. And until next time, that's right, we'll see you on the radio.